Averages and relationships and trends and graphs are not always what they seem. There may be more in them than meets the eye, and there may be a good deal less. The secret language of statistics, so appealing in a fact-minded culture, is employed to sensationalise, inflate, confuse and oversimplify. Statistical methods and statistical terms are necessary in reporting the mass data of social and economic trends, business conditions, opinion polls, the census. But without writers who use the words with honesty and understanding, and readers who know what they mean, the result can often be semantic nonsense. For example, Table 10-1 displays the gross domestic product of the United States of America in billions of dollars from the first quarter of 2011 to the first quarter of 2013. The GDP data can be represented visually. Figure 10-1 is fairly clear. It shows the growth in GDP between the first quarters of 2011 and 2013. The whole graph is in proportion and there's a zero line at the bottom for comparison. The roughly 7.5% increase in GDP actually looks like 7.5%, an upward trend that is substantial but perhaps not overwhelming. But the graph can be simplified or truncated by chopping off the bottom. The data in figure 10 too are the same, and so is the curve. Nothing has been falsified, except the impression that it gives. An undiscerning viewer sees a national income line that has climbed halfway up the paper in just over two years. A small rise has become, visually, a bigger one. Why stop with truncation? We can make the 7.5% look much livelier by simply changing the proportion between the X and Y axes. Rather than a subtle increase, the visual impact of figure 10.3 is of something much more impressive yet the data used are still exactly the same. The visual representation of exactly the same numbers can be manipulated to give the impression that GDP has soared impressively in just over two years, or that GDP has remained relatively stable in just over two years. Like good writing, good graphical displays of data communicate ideas with clarity, precision and efficiency, whereas bad graphical displays distort or obscure the data making it harder to understand or compare, or otherwise thwarting the communicative effect which the graph should convey. The essence of a graph is the clear communication of quantitative information. There are six aspects that determine the effectiveness of a visual display that portrays data. Apprehension asks, does the graph maximise understanding? Clarity, is it clear what is being communicated? Consistency, are all the graphical elements, like symbols and colours, consistent with their previous use in other graphs? Efficiency. Is the graph easy to interpret? Necessity. Is the graph actually the most useful way to represent the data? Would a table or simply written text be better? Truthfulness. Are all the graphical elements accurately positioned in proportion? Visual displays that obscure data can sometimes have very serious consequences. T minus 21 seconds and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. And liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now. At 94%, normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to uh, 65% shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Well, 
velocity, 2,257 feet per second. Altitude, 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 3 nautical miles. So the 25th Space Shuttle mission is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning, it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. It was so cold on the morning of January 28th, 1986, that icicles were hanging off the scaffolding surrounding the Space Shuttle Challenger. The night before, Martin Theocall engineers and NASA officials had debated the data concerning the effect of cold temperatures on the giant rubber-like o-rings that seal the separate sections of the rocket boosters. The engineers had even sent NASA officials 13 tables and graphs that documented increasing damage to the o-rings in colder weather, trying to make a case to delay the launch. These two graphs contain the information that could have helped NASA delay the Challenger launch, but it was obscured in a few different ways. The key contains irrelevant symbols, and the rocket images distract the viewer from vital information. Vital information has been obscured here in a few different ways. First, the viewer's attention is not directed to the critical variables of interest, temperature and damage to the o-rings. Instead, attention is directed to all those cute little rockets, and only tangentially to the indicators of damage that appear to be randomly scattered among them. Second, the numbers revealing temperature have been turned sideways, because the rockets are tall and narrow. Third, the other vital variable, indicating type of damage to the o-ring, was coded with arbitrary symbols, dots, diagonal bars and vertical stripes, rather than something intuitive, such as progressively darker marks, indicating progressively more damage. Tragically, the misleading tables and graphs were not persuasive, and NASA decided to go ahead with the shuttle launch. During the launch, a tiny gap in one of the Challenger's O-rings started leaking. Later, Cameras revealed that puffs of black smoke were visible on the launch pad. That o-ring leak grew into a flame, and then, 73 seconds after launch, the billion dollar Challenger exploded as it tried to leave Earth's atmosphere, killing all seven of its astronauts. In retrospect, the Challenger disaster could have been prevented by a graph, such as the one shown in figure 10-5, that clearly described the systematic relation between two variables temperature and damage to the o-ring material. Unfortunately, the graphs presented to NASA both before the Challenger exploded and during the investigation that followed were not created in such a way that clearly demonstrated the relation between temperature and o-ring damage. The Martin Thiokol engineers who created the graphs didn't need fancy graphs, they needed clearer graphs. The data represented in Figure 10.5 show a strong correlation that indicates a relationship between low temperature at time of launch and substantial o-ring damage. One of the worst graphs ever created provides an opportunity to learn how to create, read and interpret graphic information. This graph from the Ithaca Times seems to tell a story of increasing cost and decreasing quality. The line representing tuition goes up and the line representing Cornell University's ranking goes down. But let's examine the variety of lies in this graph. Also, notice that the graph superimposes statistical information on a picture of Cornell University's campus. So the graph's underlying message gains credibility by being associated with this Ivy League institution. The graph appears to answer the question in the headline, why does college have to cost so much? That rising line represents rising tuition costs, as measured by the share of a student family's median income over 35 years. Now look for the timeline that corresponds to the plummeting lower line. The apparently falling line represents the ranking of Cornell University over only 11 years, but the graph does not clearly convey this critical information. The absence of critical information is a red flag. So line number one, the graph treats unequal scales as if they were equal. This lie uses identical distances, almost the width of the magazine cover, to represent very different time frames. 
11 years versus 35 years. Lie number two. The graph unites incompatible measures. This lie compares an ordinal measure, university rank, to a scale measure, tuition as a proportion of income. The two ways of measuring a variable are incompatible, yet they're treated as if they were the same. This lie also helps us set up and anticipate the next lie. Lie number three. The graph uses misleading starting points. This lie arbitrarily begins the line representing quality of education, Cornell's rank compared to other institutions, lower than the line representing tuition costs as a proportion of income, suggesting that an institution already failing to deliver what students are paying for has, over the last 11 years, or perhaps 35 years, become dramatically worse. There's no reason except deception to start one line higher or lower than the other. The scales are not comparable and should not even be placed on the same graph. Line number four. The graph reverses the implied meaning of up and down. Cornell University's ranking did indeed change over this 11 year period. It improved from 15th place nationally to sixth place. Cornell's ranking didn't get worse, it got better. Why then does the line representing Cornell's ranking go down? This astonishing graphic lie reversed the direction of the numbers. In the business of rankings, a low number is good, but the graph maker made sure that the positive information about Cornell was portrayed by a line going down. If this graph were true to its data, the line representing quality of education would be rising rather impressively from 15th place to 6th place. Yet this line portrays Cornell's quality of education as falling dramatically. Taken at face value, the graph tells a negative story that might sell more newspapers. The most likely reason this misleading graph was created. A graph is a certain scientific aura, which makes us want to believe it. This makes us vulnerable to graphs that are actually misleading. Here are some of the most common ways to mislead viewers with statistical and graphic tricks. Number one, the false face validity lie. Face validity refers to whether the method used to collect data seems on the face of it to represent what it says it represents. False face validity occurs when the method seems to represent what it says, but when we dig a little deeper, it doesn't. For example, a variable might be labelled aggression, even though what is actually being measured is how many times people shout at each other. Some fairly happy families shout almost all the time, and many quiet families exchange polite comments with lethal intentions. Number two, the biased scale lie. A biased scale slants information in a particular way. For example, New York Magazine's restaurant reviewers use a scale of 0 to 5 stars. 5 stars indicate a restaurant's food, service and ambience are ethereal, almost perfect. 4 stars mean exceptional, consistently elite. 3 means generally excellent. 2 means very good. And 1 means good. So what does 0 mean? Bad? Actually, no. The magazine's restaurant reviewers say, zero stars in a review doesn't necessarily mean a restaurant is bad. It means our critics don't recommend you go out of your way to eat there. Restaurant critics using this rating scale are likely to give more positive ratings because they don't actually have any negative choices to circle when they're at the restaurant. The scale is biased. It's pulling for a certain response. Number three. The sneaky sample lie. A sneaky sample occurs when the people who participate in a study are pre-selected so that the data turn out in a particular way. For example, some students like to check out websites that rate professors, but the students most likely to participate in those rating sites are those who strongly dislike or strongly approve of a particular professor. It's not a representative sample of all students. Number four. The interpolation lie. Interpolation occurs when we state that some value between the data points necessarily lies in a straight line between those data points. 
for example. In a 2007 report on national crime levels, Statistics Canada reported one of the lowest rates of property crime since the 1970s. Without the full set of data, however, it would be easy to assume that a gradual and steady decline in crime levels had occurred over 30 years. Actually, in between these two time points, the crime levels had experienced substantial fluctuations. To spot the interpolation lie, check to be sure that a reasonable number of in-between data points have been reported. Number 5. The extrapolation lie. This lie assumes knowledge of information outside the study. Extrapolation goes beyond the data by assuming a pattern will continue indefinitely. For example, CB or citizens ban radios, a once popular communication device now used mostly by long distance truckers, have long since been replaced by mobile phones. It's likely that most of today's students have never seen one. I've never seen one. Yet in 1976, the complete CB handbook declared that the popularity of CB radios would continue to increase to the point that CB instruction would become part of the elementary school curriculum. What happened? The CB radio book didn't take into account the invention of cell phones. So don't assume a pattern in the data will continue. Number 6. The inaccurate values lie. This lie can be subtly effective. Sometimes it involves telling the truth in one part of the data, but visually distorting it in another place. This figure from the New York Times purports to show the mandated fuel economy standards set by the US Department of Transportation. The standard required an increase in mileage from 18 miles per gallon to 27.5. That's an increase of 53%. But the magnitude of increase shown in the graph is actually 783%. Number 7. The outright lie. There are many examples of people making up data to lend an air of legitimacy to an otherwise weak argument. For example, Mitch Snyder, an advocate for the homeless, repeatedly cited a statistic in the early 1980s that there were 3 million homeless Americans, a number that would have meant that actually 1 in 75 Americans were homeless. Snyder eventually admitted that he had lied because he had been pushed by reporters to provide a specific number. During the Gulf War, Patriot missiles shot down four Iraqi Scud missiles far fewer than the 41 successes and 42 engagements claimed at the war's end by the Defence Department. That meant that Iraqi missiles were intercepted only 9% of the time. John Conyers, a Democratic congressman from Michigan, said, We have watched the claims for this missile drop from 100% during the war to 96% in official statements to Congress, to 80%, 70%, 52%, 26%, and now we're under 10% and dropping. The public and Congress have been misled. In 2011, several British news sources reported on the apparent widespread failure of Implanon, a contraceptive implant. The BBC said that nearly 600 women had become pregnant despite using this popular contraceptive implant. They went on to say, there have also been more than 1,600 reports of adverse reactions to the Implanon device which is designed to prevent pregnancy for three years. The National Health Service has been forced to pay compensation to several women because of the failures. 1.4 million women have used Implanon, according to the Department of Health. The implant maker, MSD, said no contraceptive was 100% effective. It added that unwanted pregnancies may occur if the implant was not correctly inserted and said it had a failure rate of less than 1% if inserted correctly. You can read the whole of the short article for yourself here. Was this story using statistics fairly, or were readers being misled? 600 unplanned pregnancies would be shocking if it happened over a relatively short period of time. But the 600 device failures occurred over 10 years, between 1999 and 2009 so really it was only 60 per year. 1.4 million devices were implanted and they each lasted for three years, so the failure rate is actually 1.4 out of 10,000, or 0.014%, 0 
which actually backs up what the device makers said. The BBC, Daily Express, Daily Mail and the other British news sources were using statistics to mislead and sensationalise a story that was otherwise fairly trivial. 